questions. Um, I also wanted to add that there is a huge Purell like dispenser that they've uh, installed so, uh, right near their restroom. So if you want them, you just go there. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to just uh, read out some introductions just to, so you all know who you're, like the incredible people you're speaking to, or who will be speaking to you. Um, so uh, I'll just, just like raise your hand when I say your name. <laughs> um, okay, I'll start with Yashika. Yashika Dutta is a journalist and the author of Coming Out of Delhi. She spent a decade covering arts, culture, and fashion in New Delhi, and a lifetime hiding her Delhiness to pass as upper caste, until she came out of Delhi in a Facebook note and wrote a book that's part nonfiction, part memoir, and wholly a scathing account of how the caste system operates and affects Dalits in today's India. Hint, brutally. Her work explores the intersection of caste, class, and gender, and seeks to expose caste as an invisible arm that turns the gears in nearly every system in India. Coming out of Dalit has received immense critical acclaim from the press and the readers. It has been called an eye-opening contribution to Dalit literature and a book that will likely play a major role in influencing the millennial expression on being a Dalit. Thus graduated from Columbia Journalism School and lives in New York. She's planning to soon release Coming Out as Dalit Worldwide. Mimi Mondal writes science fiction and fantasy stories in a column called Extraordinary Alien for Hindu Sun Times. Her novel, His Footsteps Through Darkness and Light, is currently a finalist for the Nebula Award, and her co edited anthology, Luminescent Threads Connections to Octavia E. Butler, received a Locus Award and was a Hugo Award finalist in 2018. Mimi grew up in Kolkata and currently lives in New York. Um, Dr. Suraj Yangde is an award winning scholar and activist from India. He is an author of bestseller Cast Matters. The book went to reprint within a week of its publication date. Cast Matters is recently featured in prestigious best nonfiction books of the decade list by the Hindu. Suraj is an inaugural postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy. Suraj is nominated to India's highest literary award, Sahitya Akademi, and is a recipient of Dr. Ambedkar Social Justice Award, Canada 2019, Rohit Vemula Memorial Scholar Award 2018. Suraj is recently featured in a multi part series on caste in America sponsored by the Pulitzer Center at WGBH. Suraj inaugurated a popular column, Dalitality, at the Indian Express that centers on the issues of caste in India. Suraj Yangde is an act academic activist and a noted public intellectual in the transnational movement of Dalit rights. He's actively involved in building solidarities of Dalit, Black, Roma, Indigenous, Barakpu, and Refugee People Solidarities in the Fourth World Project of Marginalized People. Suraj holds a research associate position within the, de within the Department of African and American Studies and a non-resident fellow at the Hutchins Center for African and American uh, Research. He is also a convener of the Dalit Film Festival. Um, and this panel will be moderated by Thrubo Jyoti. Um, Thrubo is a journalist and writer based in New Delhi. They work with the Hindustan Times and write on national affairs at the intersection of caste and sexuality, especially focusing on histories of caste apartheid, elections, and citizenship. They're closely linked to the movement around caste and sexuality in South Asia that aims to decenter up caste, upper caste voices from the LGBTQIA plus movement. They hold a master's degree in astrophysics and a diploma in journalism, and are interested in exploring the links between caste and queer desire through the works of B.R. Medgar. They live and love the young. Coming out 
Thomas Dalit is a book that I wrote in 2019 about my experiences of growing up as a Dalit person but hiding my identity and basically having a window seat to um, the upper caste universe in India. And um, in 2016, I was able to talk about my identity in a public way. I was able to reclaim my identity thanks to Rohit Tamila. I hope most of us here are familiar with Rohit. He was um, a scholar who was institutionally murdered uh, because he chose to raise his voice. And he left this beautiful and scathing last letter which affected all of us, I guess if I can say so, on the panel very deeply. And for me, what it did was it lit this flame that I knew I wouldn't be able to be quiet anymore. And as a result of that, Facebook note where I acknowledged my coming out as a Dalit person came out this book. And I'm going to read a paragraph which talks about the time when I was in a boarding school in, uh, in India. And uh, just for a little context, this is part memoir, part nonfiction, so it weaves my personal story with stories of other Dalit people and analysis and reporting and facts. Because, you know, as we know, that it's always questioned on our personal narratives. We're always told we're fake, we're lying, we're not saying the truth. So I wanted to supply as many facts as possible. <clears throat> the steely resolve to do whatever it takes to educate children isn't unusual in India. Most parents who grow up underprivileged, especially Dalits, cherish the life-changing quality of good education. They make do with the bare minimum or sell properties they have painstakingly built over the years to pay for their kids' tuition. For many Indian parents, their children's education is their greatest achievement. If they happen to be Dalit, it means even more. Educating their children after previous generations were cruelly denied any form of learning becomes their life's work. It's also far more challenging since most Dalit children can't really afford quality education. In addition to the financial barriers, Dalits also face hostility from upper caste society, even more so when girls are being educated. Delta Meghwal's father, she's a Dalit girl who passed away, is killed. Delta Meghwal's father, Mahendra Meghwal, faced similar opposition because he sent his daughter to a distant town to study. Delta was 17 when she was allegedly raped by a teacher and murdered at the polytechnic she attended in Bikane, Rajasthan. Bright and ambitious, Delta was the first girl from her village to complete high school and leave to study outside. Even as his neighbors in the village blame her education for her death, Mahendra Meghwal, a Dalit educator, remains proud of her achievements. A similar sentiment drove us to stand in front of the principal's office at Masuri Public School in India. My mom held on to my hand tightly. She must have felt as nervous as other Dalit parents who took an immense leap of faith for their children. She was taking a huge financial risk and had no support from anyone else except my dad, who kept himself in the background. We didn't have the money to pay the fees, yet we hoped that my sister and I would secure admission. Mom knew she had to convince the principal to allow that. I knew I had to be good enough for him to do that. Before I went in for the interview, she looked at me and asked, Ho jayana, which means you'll get in, right? I had no option but to say yes and make it happen somehow. They gave us three weeks to return with school uniforms, rain boots, bed sheets, evening uniform, and the bulkiest winter clothes I have ever seen. This time, mom openly told me to hide my caste and answer Parasha Brahmin when someone asked. She wasn't worried about my sister who was much paler in comparison and could easily pass for upper caste and barely three years old at the time. We arrived deep into spring session, weeks away from the quarterly exams. Even then, we didn't have the peace in full. My grandfather knew he had no choice but to agree to sell the property that we had in Jaipur, but he dragged his heels. 
the school administration that had already done us a huge favor by agreeing to let us pay after the due date has passed, balked when we couldn't pay them. We spent the morning and afternoon going in and out of offices and waiting to see the school principal, a silver-haired educator in his late 50s, P.K. Kakyao. On his way to lunch, he agreed to meet mom and dad, only to tell them that he couldn't help. Mom shuffled out of his office, wiping her red eyes with a corner of her olive green chiffon dupatta. She had come so close to be turned away at the gate. Throughout the afternoon, mom and dad visited every officer who was in the school administration office, hoping one of them would understand how important this admission was to us. Each time mom returned to check on us and sat next to my sister, my baby brother and me, her face bloated from crying for hours. I wanted to scream, I don't want this. Except my screams never made it past my throat. As I sat there watching the circus of her humiliation with mute horror and shame, I knew I didn't want the admission as much as my mom did. I knew this education would change my life and I was willing to let my parents go out for it. Eventually, Mr. Katyal gave my parents six, week, six weeks to pay the rest of the fees and agreed to admit us. By then, shame had turned into great bitterness. I knew no matter what I achieved, it would be because I had let my mom bleed and cry to make it happen. That's why when weeks later, the same principal, Mr. Katyal, called me on stage to announce to more than 400 students and teachers that I had scored a high rank in exams with fewer than 10 days to prepare, I felt nothing. To my mind, if someone like me could score so well, then the school couldn't be all that great. For years after that, this sentiment persisted. No institution that accepted me could be all that good, including Columbia Journalism School. <laughs> I was never good enough for anything. And once I became good enough, it stopped being good enough for me. fiction and fantasy, and uh, I write about India, but uh, most of my publications are here, so I primarily write for an American audience. Um, but I'm from India, and uh, so what, what I want to read from is the story called um, His First Steps Through Darkness and Light, which is a long short story called A Novelette. And it's currently nominated for the Nebula Award, uh, which is a thing. But, um, it's a story that takes place in a circus, and I have a series of stories that take place in the circus in this um, fictional version of India, really. So it, I mean, there is some historical research in it, but the historical research is also like mixed up with each other, so it's not tremendously, I mean, it's anachronistic and so on. Um, so I'll start, and the voice is male, uh, the first person. I am not a fighter. I am a trapeze master. At the majestic Oriental Circus, which had been my home for two years, I had climbed the ropes deft and fast till I was the leader of a team of about 15 aerial performers. He was in my jeans. There were other rewards, too, of the circus life. It had brought me to the grace of Shehzad Marib. A trapeze master has no lack of duties, training and overseeing his team, but I continued to perform with Shehzad in his grand stage illusion show, Aladdin and his Magic Lamb. I took great pride in my own trapeze act and the team that I trained from scratch, but I have to admit that Aladdin was the crowd's favorite. None of the credit for that popularity was owed to me. 
I'm a genius at the ropes overhead, flinging myself from grip to grip so gracefully you could believe I could fly. But on earth, up close, I'm a man entirely devoid of charm. Before I joined the circus, I did not even speak a language that could be understood in polite society. Even now, I fumble for the right word at the right moment, uh, occasionally slip into an accent that makes the city people sneer. But as Aladdin, all I had to do was to put, up, put on a pair of satin pants and a skull cap and parrot a series of memorized lines. I had never met an Arab street urchin, nor had an inkling what the words meant. But neither did anybody in the audience. I bellowed, Yala, and shook her head. Dafauja Shetan, and my kids. <laughs> the girl who trained the parakeets doubled as the princess in a shiny kagra and choli, adorned with sequins. Johuri, our proprietor and ringmaster, completed the cast as the villainous Zafar, dressed in a moth eaten velvet cloak. It was an almost ridiculous performance, but it turned into the most renowned act of the majestic Oriental Circus all at the touch of Shezad Marid, as the three of us hemmed and hawed through our scripted gibberish, the genie would emerge from his lamp in clouds of curling smoke. Illuminated by our cheap stage lights, the clouds would take the shape of a magnificent palace, the gaping maw of a cave, raging armies on horseback, that crashed into the audience until our entire circus tent would erupt with gasps and applause and cries of horror and disbelief. A small child could open, hold open his palm and receive a dancing hoodie, crafted immaculately of ice as the clouds condensed. Then they billowed up again into monsters, swooping rock birds, clerics whose voices soared in prayer across minarets that pierced the sky above a faraway mythical city, hundreds of jinn, and then back to the only one. It was a show unlike anything offered by any rival circus company on our land. Um, just let me know if I'm running out of time. I, I was assigned to this act four months after I joined the Majestic Oriental Circus, a naive, illiterate village young man who had been given a job by Dayaram, the former trapeze master, almost out of pity. It turned out that I, I climbed better than anyone else on the team, but I had never seen a circus before, could hardly follow the shimmering line between illusion and truth. Before I took over, Johuri would play both Aladdin and Zafar, disappearing behind the clouds and reappearing in changed costume with a lightness of foot you wouldn't expect from a fat middle-aged man like him. But then, no one at the majestic oriental circus was merely what met the eye. The circus life is not for the mundane. Johuri had been happy to delegate Aladdin to me. Okay, uh, I'm almost done. An agile young man was more suited to the role than himself, he had said, with a wink in front of the entire company. I nodded along, but both of us knew that was just the cover. A circus troupe has no dearth of agile young men. No, we both knew it was because I was the only other person at the Majestic Oriental Circus that Shazad Mari had entrusted with his lamp. Super introductory. Yeah. You can take my time. Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dubo, Yashika, Mimi. Um, these are one of uh, India's most recognized word slayers, and uh, um, sharing a panel with them is, is really an honor. And thank you for making my life enriching because when I read, I feel more connected. But you know, Let's let's acknowledge uh, the great work of Ben and Priya. Let's give it up to them for really putting this together. And we also wish Ben and Christina uh, good luck for the rest of their life. <laughs> Thank you, Anu, for uh, offering this space and the Vidkar Initiative. I was thinking, you know, what to speak on. 
and then I will also speak from the book. Um, <coughs> so I, I, so my thing is when I write and when it's published, I really, really go back and read. Uh, so, <laughs> so it might sound for, for me almost like first time uh, on Dalit nationalism I will speak. But before I speak on Dalit nationalism, I'll talk about how important it is, for example, to have more Dalits into the spaces. Right? You see, you have been, and what has been done? He has created more spaces. He has democratized the otherwise Brahminical, patriarchal setup of how this you know, cesspool of casteism has given us. And I think Ben has really proven that. And so thank you, Ben. <laughs> Dalit nationalism. The Dalit nationalism project remains absent from radical and conservative Dalit political spectrums. Dalit nationalism has the rightful potential to demand equality on its own terms without frugal negotiations. This would set an uncompromising and non-co-opting tone of liberation. There are no national level political calls for Dalit land, land exclusively set aside for Dalits in rural and urban areas for the uprooted Dalit community, which is in tune with Ambedkar's thesis of separate settlement. The agricultural census of 2015-2016 states that 92 percentage of land holdings operated by Dalits comprised of small and marginal holdings, which is not exceeding two hectares. The poorest of farmers belong to the Dalit community, whose operational holding is depressingly 78.06%, that is less than two hectares. In a casteist economic order, Dalits are the most viable, accessible, loyal, and determined labor. Hence, the logic behind putting Dalits closer to the chain of production is to extract undeniable labor. Yet at the same time, the same system is seen to obliterate every liberatory move of Dalits. Dalit nationalism is also a space of congeniality and mutual respect. It is not a space that espouses ethnocentric nationalism. It is not a geographically constricted speciality. It is a consciousness of the highest standard based on the solid foundation of respect to everyone. Dignity and justice form the crux of the late nationalism, which is a radical reimagination of selves in the topography of human virtues. The late nationalism centers its attention on the lives of Dalit, the most vulnerable section of society who need care and attention as the society mirrors the failures of collective humanity. By redrawing the lines of human created boundaries, it breaks the axis of separation and encircles everyone who is willing to let go of their inhuman virtues. In it, there is absence of hatred, but a firm conviction to return to the privileged blind entitled oppressor castes. It is not an appeal to the consciousness of the oppressor, it is a direct action of the oppressed. I differentiate between liberation and emancipation. The essentiality of liberation and emancipation presents to us the quandary of the current Dalit condition. Dalits want liberation as opposed to emancipation. Emancipation seeks to patronize the autonomous movement of self-liberation, which is radical and uncompromising. Emancipation offers a suggestive liberal approach, that is to work within the structures that are often maintained by continuing oppression through different, albeit disguised means. Working in a system that operates on confining the marginalized to the ascribed position, emancipation suggests that rulers and owners should be gentle in their murderous treatment towards their subjects. It appeals to the consciousness of the governing class. It, is not, it does not prioritize the urgency of the oppressed, neither is it willing to work with the oppressed on their own terms. It instead offers a prescription, a ready-made solution to the oppressed masses on how to free themselves without holding oppressors absolutely accountable for the horrors they and their ancestors commit. And therefore, Emancipation is giving a charitable act on the account of the dominant who benefit out of the oppressive system. The constitutional method as a route to Dalit emancipation precludes the call for the total liberation of Dalits. This over reliance on the constitution, which does not make provisions for the abolition of caste-based identities, has in effect kept caste alive and intact by giving permission to uphold caste-derived virtues 
which ought to be, but are not, and constitutes them. Thus, the thin line between Dalit emancipation and Dalit liberation remains blurred. Liberation equals radicalism, where emancipation surrenders to the conformity of the status quo. Liberation is a fight towards consciousness. However, emancipation takes away from consciousness, thereby enslaving the totality of Dalit pride and Dalit agency. Dalit liberation doctrine brings with it self-sufficiency and confidence of Dalits by becoming and making them governing class that is equipped to self-rule of Dalits and without anyone else's deriding pattern.
that this, there is a possibility of being a Dalit person who looks like this or who talks like this. And um, going back to the earlier part of your question, Dubo, um, the how caste is visible, and at the same time, it's it's not. So, one you know, I want to take it back to this, and we're in an academic space. So, one of the ideas in academia is that caste is over, not just in academia, in the in the, in the American public sphere, Mimi and I were just talking about this before uh, the panel. That you know, when some when I tell somebody that you know I work with caste or this is my work or you know I write about caste, the first question people ask is, does that still exist? Mm -hmm. So you know, it starts with us having to prove our identities, us having to prove our intersectionality within the South Asian diaspora, us having to convince people that we exist, mm -hmm. which is in itself. Um, a lot of labor, and, and I don't want to just throw these terms around and not have them mean anything. What that means is it takes a toll on a human being to constantly having to prove that they matter and that they exist. And that is one of the ways caste kills you. Caste kills your spirit and caste kills your soul. Growing up in Ajmer, which is kind of a mid-sized town, um, we were told that caste doesn't matter. And like going back to the academic point I was making earlier, in academia there's this idea that only economic status matters in India now. Caste is not controlling anything, which has been proved patently false. In studies that came out in 2018, it's shown that at least um, even big cities, even big urban areas like Delhi, Bangalore, Bombay, they're segregated on the basis of caste. Uh, lower caste people, lower caste people, Dalits live in clusters, as any kind of segregation works, as we're familiar with. They live in clusters in the outskirts, often. And they don't have access to basic civic amenities. So what that does is it hampers your opportunity for education, it hampers your opportunity for employment, and if you're poor, you stay poor. And growing up in Ajmer, we, my family, had the opportunity to break out of that. We weren't living in a Dalit ghetto get a quote unquote, or, or busty. We were living in a colony. But even that, even then, we were called the, the Bhangyo Kabhar. And I say that because I'm from the lowest of the low caste in India, the manual scavenging caste. And the, the caste phase of oppression is linked to your profession. And our profession, our ancestral profession, was to go and clean toilets. So we were the, the house where people went and cleaned toilets, even though my grandfather was a civil servant. Um, and what that did was people visited our home and never drank water, which is fine, you don't want to soak them water anyway if they don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but beyond that, what that did was basic things. If there is a drain that needs to be put in place, whose house is it going to be in front of? The people who go and clean toilets. These small decisions, are, are actually really big in our, in our lives because they feel, or the upper caste people, or the policy makers feel that it's okay for a man who's scavenging household to live surrounded by filth, to be able to, to, to have to be forced to inhale the noxious fumes that they should be doing anyway. And because we broke out of that caste profession, there is a huge vengeance and anger, even in urban areas, to stop our rise, our, our ability to break out of our caste-based um, professions. And that is just one of the ways that caste shows up in urban areas. But in terms of how it's concealed, I mean, I've talked about it extensively in the book. The way it's concealed is that we, force, we are forced to conceal it ourselves. We are forced to hide our identities and lie about our last names when someone asks. Or we stay in constant fear about being found out. Where I'm from, it's this place called Rajasthan. It's this, you know, the, the word translates to the place of royals. There are beautiful palaces, it's highly patriarchal. It, it figures the worst in all indices, whether it's um, violence against women or caste discrimination. I'm sure a lot of the American people might have been there to discover themselves. It's <laughs> one of those places. Um, but Rajasthan is also really high up on the index of untouchability. 50%, 50% urban dwelling people in Rajasthan. 
believe that untouchability is okay in 2018. One out of two people think that it's okay to discriminate against me. And I, I knew that growing up in the 90s and early 2000s, I knew that I didn't need data to tell me that 50% people don't think I'm a human being. I knew that in my bones. And which is why when I hid my caste, when my mother asked me to hide my caste, I did it because I'd seen consequences. I'd seen the invisibility um, that happens. When someone looks through you, when, when you tell someone your caste, and I did tell someone my caste when I was 15 years old, my friend, who didn't know, and I went to her house, and her parents asked me, obviously, the second question after they served me tea was, what's your caste? Mm -hmm. And I told them in a moment of rebellion, and, and I've talked about this before, sorry to Olivia Paul if you're hearing this, but I'll go. <laughs> it was like a bomb diffused in the room when I told that I'm Bhangi. I couldn't even, in fact, I couldn't even say the words Bhangi. I said, I'm, I'm scheduled class. And they were so enraged that they had to sit next to me and serve tea to me because untouchability traveled through, through, through food and through water and through tea. And after that, that girl, next day I met her in the bus and I said hi to her, and she looked past me. It was like I didn't exist. And at that age, I learned what it would mean to not hide my cast. So even when I grew up surrounded by this extreme idea of what it means to be not just Dalit, but from a caste where till two generations ago, your parents went and cleaned people's bathrooms, I had no option but to hide. And, and I've had a lot of flack for that, I've faced a lot of flack for that, by the way, where people on Twitter from within the Dalit community mm. have often told me, why do you need to hide? It's a scheme, it's a scam, you're doing it for advantage, political gain. First of all, I want to be successful. I mean, hello, that's why I work hard. So, uh, you know, uh, that's one, being a, a woman asserting herself and being confident and not apologizing for ambition is, in any part of the world, a problem. But beyond that, it's also that I'm told that why couldn't I just openly come out and be proud of my caste? What does it mean to be proud of being Bhangi? Until I came out, I didn't know what that looked like. So that's why it's really, yeah, it, it's a complex way of being, you know, coming out and sometimes hiding. It's a really complicated way. And when you're told, just be confident, it doesn't work. actively imagining and writing about fantasy in Ethiopia. Um, I wanted to ask you two specific things. One um, was to tell us a little bit more about how you value uh, the literary structure and your practice with political thinking around caste. And secondly, about um, writing about marginalized characters in science fiction and what does that entail? Yes, let me scratch an answer. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm an English graduate from India. In India, we largely read literary fiction. And um, so I came in through more speculative fiction, really through magical realism, like South Asian and Global South magical realism, more than existing science fiction and fantasy. And I mean, I didn't know that when I was younger. But now I know why, because a lot of older science fiction and fantasy is very discriminatory on all angles. And like a lot of lot, lot of the older canon of science fiction and fantasy is kind of now getting rejected. It's sexist, it's racist, it's homophobic, it's terrible. Mm -hmm. And it's also really bad prose. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, so, um, so I read a lot of magical realism and I read like, you know, Indian writing in English and I, largely saw upper caste people. And they were stories, you know, deeply intellectual writers. I loved their writing. I did not see myself in them, right? Yeah. And, but that was the mode I was writing in. When I came here, I, I moved into science fiction fantasy pretty um, accidentally. And in America, 
I noticed and I didn't know that before coming to America that science fiction fantasy is a largely different environment and they have reasonably different um, literary ambitions, expectations, as well as like, you know, stories and forms that they like. So I learned some of those things after coming to America, which has been like maybe five years ago. So, and there aren't that many other Dalit writers in science fiction and fantasy. I haven't met others. So I know Dalit literary fiction writers, but they're not really going towards the same goal. So science fiction and fantasy tends to be a lot more plot-based and representation-based and um, less abstract stories and so on. And so one of the things I picked up, like the question that you asked about like world building and so on, is from Afrofuturist authors. And uh, one of them is Octavia Butler. Another one is Nora Jemison, who I really hoped would be here. She lives in New York, but she couldn't make it. And what I learned from these authors is that especially when they're writing things like dystopia, where, when they're writing like a post-apocalyptic world or an apocalyptic world, and you're writing an apocalyptic work, like see, the general idea, general Hollywood movie idea of apocalypses that we have, if something goes really wrong, then people's lives start falling apart, right? People get a little inhuman. You have to learn new skills. And if you think about it, usually that generic subject is like a middle class white man. So those are, you're thinking from that person's position of what the world falling apart looks like. And when you read Octavia Butler, you see that you're looking from, say, a black woman's perspective of what the world falling apart looks like, right? And it looks different because these people were not already living in a privileged world. They were not living in a safe world. They have different skills and they also have different ways of looking at grief, like say a person who comes from a history of slavery. How does losing a child feel to that person, right? So your world building, like, which is a very common word in science fiction and fantasy because we're always building pretty largely different worlds, unlike literary fiction, right? Your idea of civilization, your idea of history, for instance, like this is one of the things that I've read. I am really bad at like, quoting academic authors. I left academia a long time ago. But like when you look at the Dalit vision of history, for instance, right? Say Indian independence. Like there, there, there's conversations about when you're looking from the Dalit perspective, how much they've changed, right? Like so these are some of the idea you bring ideas you bring into science fiction and fantasy that from the people who are oppressed, from the people who are already having to hide, how does a changing world look like? And so, so sometimes when I'm writing stories, and this story does have cast, and this is actually a larger world, so, and it, this is on Tor.com, so the entire thing is on Tor.com if you look, look it up. Uh, but there are other stories which are like expansions of this world, and it's not very distant from the, current world, it's almost an India, it's just not called India, so there are things like caste. But sometimes I write like completely apocalyptic worlds, except that I'm writing from a sensibility where people are not middle class comfortable, like at least the POV character is not that. So, and I, I have one story which I haven't published yet, I wrote it for a conference in Germany last year where so there's a tsunami in a very apocalyptic world which has very difficult climate and like, you know, entire city gets destroyed and the uh, POV character is a girl who lives in the streets. And now all the refugees are going to another part, like a, a more privileged country, let's say like America. And she is happy in a way because now all the rich people and her are at the same level. And like, you know, the older rich people are getting like calluses in their foot because they're walking and she already has calluses, like she doesn't have problems. Mm -hmm. So some of these are interesting ideas for me to explore. And I mean, given that I'm a Bengali Dalit and Bengal has, like Bengal casteism is a lot more passive. Bengal casteism is a lot more ingrained, right? And even before, like I, I didn't really have like a, I didn't have a completely similar coming out experience because we do have a Dalit last name. It's 
just that when I was growing up, my parents said, you should do because we are not Dalit. Like that is what they told, told me. Like because my family going back were farmers for a while because like in all, you know, untouchability kind of became more distant in the 19th century. So like my family were landowning farmers and they were, my mother just said, no, we're not untouchable because I mean, our family doesn't have untouchability history. Well, maybe two generations back because beyond that there are no papers, mm. right? So I knew I was Shidul Kash, not Dalit. I had my last name, but I didn't know I was being discriminated within a framework. Like there was a time, like I, in school, when I was a kid, sometimes some kids like when fighting with me would say things like, you look like a domestic cat. And I thought, and I was told by everyone, firstly that that kid is nasty, don't listen to them. And also they said it was about your darkness of complexion. And later I compared those with like upper caste kids who were in the same shade as me and they had never gotten that. Mm. So, so a lot of my fiction, even before I got into writing science fiction fantasy or even before I was very conscious about this, like I used to have all these chameleon characters, a lot of my POV characters were people who passed as very different other kinds of people. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, sorry, that's very scattered. Beautiful. Well, that was amazing. Beautiful. 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 Um, so, written a powerful uh, book that's an expositional cast and, uh, and both society and politics as it functions in India today. You were able to do um, the autobiography, and you were able to do uh, a lot of commentary, pieces, um, a kind of social exposition of what is going on. So I wanted to ask you both a little bit about uh, the instrument of the autobiography mm -hmm. being this really uh, powerful and groundbreaking tool in bringing out uh, and, and kind of center teaching Dalit experiences of India. But also, and because politics and nationalism make such an important part of the book, ask you a little bit about Dalit political futures and what your hope is that. Thank you. Thanks, Dilbo. Um, see, Dalits are political subjects 24 7. So, uh, to depoliticize their own bodies is it's a very difficult. So, that's why the scrutiny comes so uh, scathing because uh, we are politically uh, explosive, uh, not only electorally, but also uh, the political subjectivity transcends into non hetero, non realizing anything. And, and that's why I think. Our placement is, is, is in a way that people are unable to fathom. People are unable to fathom, you know, various uh, uh, various um, even aesthetics that we carry as ourselves, even without caring about, you know, you know the last name. This is a political uh, statement, right? It's a statement of, you know, a young lady, uh, a child of a, you know, untouchable, uh, you know, who, you know, a grand grandchild of a, a landless laborer. Uh, is now you know pronouncing certain you know big terms and you know trying to uh, look on the face and challenge the entire structure you know on his face. I think that is something that is uh, the 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 casteist and in the world they are not prepared. That's why they are trying to uh, tell us slow down, tell us more about you first. You know because because they don't know how to how to reconcile because these new ideas that are coming you know. They're not coming through my, it's coming through the force of my ancestors. Like the way I was taught, the way I was brought up, it's in my blood, it's in the way I think, it's in the way I act, and it's in the way I fight, streets as well as, you know, on debates. And I think these, uh, these nuances are, are, are so, uh, so much in the air, and, and, and people would like to breathe it, but it's, it's difficult air. Uh, you know, you have to get all of that poison that has been, you know, conditioned on us. And that's why, so the, when I wrote this book, um, there was a lot of Plato, Heidegger, and I wrote it in a very humanist tradition because I, I loved the, the Greek Roman thinking. Uh, but the publisher, and you know, and it took many people to convince me that we need your story also in this. And I said, I don't want to. Uh, this is my thesis, and you know, and it took a 
it almost took a mini village <laughs> within our friends and, and you know the community to say that you know you need to little bit loosen your language because you will miss an important opportunity that you know that you have. Um, and I think that's where uh, the my autobiographical part, which I truly really tried to limit it, came in the third iteration. The first two iterations were basically you know the editor will send <laughs> the comments that I will send back without doing anything there. I will just <laughs> I will just you know. Uh, Add more complexity to this because see, uh, the experience of caste is, is not something you can simply streamline in a sentence because it comes with so much, so much uh, uh, cobwebs, and one cannot authenticate the experience just by you know writing you know in some words. You know, it, it's almost musical. One has to dance through it. One has to perform to totally grasp the condition. Unless we read this and we sit it, that's very much a radical notion of. You know, grasping what other is, but you know, then it's beyond that. You know, uh, they perform. You know, uh, the musicality is there, and the artwork is there. So we need to play around those canvases. And I think that's where we can perhaps understand because this is the first generation. If you think in a in a in a context, who is actually writing in in, in a way? Who is you know after a maker perhaps <laughs> you know. Uh, I think we knew Gya, uh, uh, Legendran was here many uh, decades ago, and then you know now Ben and a few others are coming. Yashika was here, but what I'm saying is this is a this is not something that uh, is a template model, um, and, and that's why that's why it becomes a heavy responsibility on all of us, right? Uh, almost to you know stand on the shoulders of not immediate previous generation but the generation before. And before, because after a bit, there was a gap that we saw in especially, you know, especially in the English sphere. I'm not talking about the other regional languages which are rich in repository, but within the English sphere, we had to really play out the words. And, and there were many vocabularies that didn't make sense at all. You know, and many of us had quite an experience where, how do I, for example, the Dalit stories are written by Brahmins. Brahmins continue to, I mean, even in their goodness, the Brahmins still want to hold on to that, which is, you know, which is again a kind of complicated space to be, right? How how do we how do we even you know uh, cross over this mountain of uh, other complexities these people have created, you know? And that's why in my book there is no uh, you know there are no so-called caste theoreticians, so-called caste uh, philosophers and all because you know I think their time has gone because uh, what they did was they complicated further, you know. If it's if it's Homo hierarchicus, you know. It's, 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 it's a good text, you know, for any academic publishing house, but uh, what is it, who is it serving the purpose for, you know? And I think we were all looking through through this, and that's what the Dalit future is this, is where all other forms of expressions, uh, it, is, it is not, it is definitely not heterocentric, heteronormative, it is definitely not part of any, uh, the Brahminical patriarchal formulations about you know looking at women in different subjectivities. It's it's modern, but yet there are certain fears. Many of this new and this is my fear, especially Twitter fear and, and Facebook fear, is the younger generation Dalits that I see are getting educated with Twitter and Facebook and stuff like that. And I think the theoretization of their own experiences sometimes might misplace themselves. And I think my thing is they need to, you know, go out, basically, you know, get out of that whole split. Because I meet people and say, you know, and almost a Twitter famous or, or, or Facebook famous or, or somebody famous is their guiding point, which is a great thing. But I think if you look through the experiences through your grandmothers, if you don't have that experiences, or through your grandfather's life, you know, I think that's where, because ancestral giving are some things that is more unique than anything else. And I think we need to, that's why we need to democratize it very much. And that's how the fear, uh, the future comes with, with certain fears for me. Uh, thank you so much to all three um, panelists for um, responding to those questions. Uh, between the three of them, uh, maybe Yashika and Suraj represent some of the most uh, dynamic as well as diverse uh, parts of uh, New Dalit writing in India. And of course, uh, uh, and we've just kind of seen the both the depths and the uh, rich diversity they bring to the conversation around uh, not just 
the ways in which caste tangibly and intangibly play out, plays out in India, but also how it impacts uh, not just the lives of uh, millions of people, but also their imaginations. Uh, such work is uh, very important in English, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and especially important uh, because of the ways in which uh, the language is able to travel, is able to inform, and is able to historicize. Uh, I also want to uh, acknowledge that uh, a lot of work is going on in India in various non-English languages. Uh, where writers are able to push the envelope um, on what is considered, and this is the fear, right, on what is considered, what is Dalit writing? Uh, and it's, it's both uh, rebellion, it's, both, it's, it's hope, but it's also, as uh, Suraj so deftly points out, uh, a fear or caution about the future, about whether one gets pigeonholed as a Dalit writer, right? Um, uh, and maybe uh, a hope for a future where writers from other castes can be also um, recognized as Brahmin writers, as Banya writers, as Banya writing, right. or Brahmin history. That's right. right? Um, and with that hope of the future, I want to open this up uh, and invite questions, comments, reflections. Questions would be great uh, from <laughs> um, members of the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and if you could do a short introduction. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So my name is Isaac. I live here in New York. I use Zidane pronouns. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. I think it's great to hear you. So I do have a question for Mimi. Just, this is, you know, a literary question. Um, so as someone who's, you know, from, you could call it both a blessing and a curse being from a circus family. Okay. I wanted to ask you, you know, as a world that is largely both fantasized about and is, has a long place in speculative fiction. Um, I and it's also because it itself is a fantastical medium, wanted to ask you what it is that you see in the circus and why is it you chose this particular world as a vessel for you to build your as you know as a nexus for your own world building. I think like circus things like movies, I mean these are like super common tropes actually in science fiction fantasy for people who want to class as other kinds of people. So um, these stories that I started writing, I, I started writing them before I was aware of a lot of the legends. So I was, but then as I just mentioned that I was writing all these chameleon characters without knowing why I was doing it. I was like subconsciously writing all these people who pass and I mean, I was queer before I was Dalit. Like, consciously. And so I was writing a lot of these passing characters and I'm interested in history. India had a circus golden age in the 1930s. Mm. So yeah, I mean, and and this is back when obviously it's a very casteist society and this was a foreign performance. And as you know that like all, all these foreign arts that came in, uh, a lot of lower caste people went into it because the upper caste people wouldn't touch it, right? So there was a period, I mean, Kerala still has a history of like, Kerala has a circus academy or something that keeps uh, yeah. trapeze people and so on. So there, and uh, there were strong men, like Indian strong men that went all over the world. And some of them, like there, this one guy who passed as Mexican and like he was, he passed as Mexican in American circus, but he's Indian and probably not that. Big. But, um, but there were like a lot of these intersections and all these characters in these various stories, like some of them, like a lot of them are passing as different other things. So there's one story just has an old, old woman who climbs buildings in the city because she's supposed to be coming from a tribe that lived in trees that did not exist. But um, when I wrote it, a lot of people liked it because I, I was um, mostly getting them read by audiences here. Apparently it was convincing enough that people <laughs> so, but I was just like basically examining tribal politics, like and, and also when you come from a come from a place that you're trying to hide, when you're rural, and this guy where he says that I I couldn't even speak a language that the city people respected, right? So yeah, so it's actually not very like it's pretty stereotypical to use the circus for something like that, but. I guess I'm doing an Indian version of it. <laughs> um, questions? Um, 
you and then you can just keep coming back home. So we take both our letters and just come back home. I, uh, I'm Arvind Gandhi Gopal. I teach in New York University. Thanks so much for your uh, presentation. I have a two part question. Uh, the first part is uh, uh, asking the panelists to say something about this location, United States, which uh, can be understood in different ways. One is as a more intensely Brahminical space because it's a space of largely upper caste migration uh, where uh, precisely those skills which are uh, sort of selected and or designated as Brahmin get accentuated here. The other way to think about it, which uh, I'd like to sort of ask you to comment on, is uh, that uh, uh, because there are so few lower caste people here, and so, so few Dalits here, it changes the dynamics of caste in a way that uh, maybe offers space for intervention sure. and uh, new kinds of uh, uh, behavior, uh, new kinds of uh, acceptance perhaps. And the second is the relationship between this space and uh, the old country, so, so to I, say. I, I don't get because the, all, all of you yeah. do uh, move between these spaces. I don't get the more like I'll start with the more populist answer because I'm a fiction writer and editor in science fiction fantasy. And so I look at a lot of people's Indian characters, like writers send them to me to be edited and non-Indian writers. And oh my God, I am tired of telling people Indians are non-vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> Do not write a vegetarian character. Like you're literally, oh, this was the best part. I, I, an author sent me a Dalit character. In great, like in good intention, this author wanted to, non South Asian author, wrote a Dalit character, which went through two Indian American sensitivity readers, which means they read through for authenticity of things. And I was the third authenticity reader. And this character in that novel is still saying, Is there a vegetarian version of this? And I am like, That is exactly what a Dalit doesn't do. <laughs> like, that's the opposite of a Dalit marker. And yes, I mean, it's so, so unknown. And like, I didn't know Indians were vegetarian was even a stereotype before I came here. <laughs> yeah, um, so going back to your question about what United States does for you and how it is intensely Brahminical because according to some surveys by Quality Labs had a survey recently, 2% uh, population of Indians in the US are lower caste or Dalit. And that goes to speak to the institutional discrimination that lies in India. Who gets the opportunity to move? Who gets into the institutes uh, that, that sends people to come here? Who is uh, a part of the systems, the knowledge systems, that even has the understanding to come to the United States? When I was even 26, a couple of years ago, I didn't know. How does one get to the US? <coughs> what does one have to do? I just had no idea how to go about things. And the reason I was able to learn how to do that is because I saw a colleague of mine who went to NYU. And I saw what he did. And I was able to learn from that. Those are knowledge systems that exist in upper caste structures naturally. And those are knowledge systems that Dalits don't have access to. So that's why we don't. It was impossible for me to even think about moving to the US. I just did not think that would ever happen. So, and even, it took me a few years to look around and understand how normal it is for people, how casual it is that they are here and they're not grateful for every day. And of course, this is not to say that US doesn't have issues, etc. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying just the idea and the intensity that I felt uh, before coming here, people just don't feel that way. But also coming to the US, what it did for me was, it gave me the chance to escape. Escape the constant questioning of my past, having to justify who I was every day. And also escape the fear of being found out. It's like what Nini said, you know, it's very similar. That's why I frame it in a way of uh, coming out. Because it is this double identity that you live with, where you feel that, you know, someone will get you. They will humiliate you and they will call you out and they will tell you you're not Brahmin as you're pretending to be. Mm -hmm. And that stopped happening. And my awakening happened in classrooms much like these when I heard my classmates who were talking about their own identities 
and I learned about um, the trauma that they had to go through, their different identities because of those. And then I started thinking maybe what I'm, how I think about my past is all wrong. That's when I was, I was able to get the objective distance to understand that maybe there is nothing to be ashamed about being Dalit. Just maybe this is something I could derive some amount out of. So moving to the US, and that's why I don't want to go back, uh, because I can be a racialized brown woman, mm -hmm. which is in itself a contested identity, but I'm still an Indian, not lower caste unless I want to be. And the career thing stings me so much because I have a bunch of degrees that were not a good fit for me because no one told me they were not a good fit for me. Like they didn't, <laughs> like they were doing subjects. I didn't really know what the subjects had or what career opportunities they had. And like I went into the university and I'm like, this is actually not what I thought I would be studying. <laughs> you know, see, the Every colonial project is Brahminical to its core. You can date back to the Max Muller's idea of how colonialism was actually expansion of the uh, one national Madharma and how the, uh, the English uh, took the model and you know created. And I think in the contemporary context, uh, America is an is a so quote unquote escape route for uh, stupid Brahmins, <laughs> meaning who don't have the courage to face the social, political, and economic realities would like to adopt this way and claim it as a meritorious achievement, which is ironical in its, you know, it's bubbling. And in, you know, in our context, we call buddhus. So these, you know, buddhus tend to utilize the American programmatic dream of which was very much white middle class dream to their advantage and to try to, you know, utilize this. And I think that's why within the caste context, it gets more crucial because we also had our own Boston Brahmins here, right? <laughs> Which is itself a, a unique class and continues to be the ruling class in various think tanks, you know, political respect. These are basically, so we have that uh, very racialized, you know, you know, kind of contestation of who, who, who forms this. Now we are doing, especially at the Kennedy School, we are hoping to do this new research on identifying what caste votes for what. And, 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 and in addition to that, I think our thesis premise is we have way more lower caste, which is OBC scheduled castes, uh, and hopefully scheduled tribes who are in America. It's because post 1990s, after Mandel, uh, uh, a reservation was there, many OBCs benefited of that, and they came over. It's just that I, I don't think there is any all America OBC Association, which will give access to, you know, there are Dalit associations. Uh, I don't know about tribal associations, I haven't heard. But if you are able to create that space for OBCs to be OBC, and yet be American, I think that will be a, a unique uh, kind of case. Because post-1990s uh, migration, especially in the IT sector that we see, especially coming from the southern Indian belt, you know, OBCs were in huge numbers, and I, I keep meeting them. But this OBC has become Hinduized. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, as, as Kanchalaya said once, he said, when he's himself OBC, he's an OBC when they come to America, they're looking for two things. One is vegetarian restaurant, <laughs> and second is temple. And then of course, you know, I'm paraphrasing him, but he, he, he just was like, why don't they feel the same? And I think this American dream has totally uh, given new edge for one to be a caste. Uh, a focused individual, and as well as groups, so the OBCs become Reddies, or you know, again, you know, they they they, they try to adjust into other Hindu groups, and you see them on the Independence Day uh, celebrations in, in in one of the parks, and then you know, uh, and, and unfortunately, these OBCs then become mobilized against their own cause, especially when it comes to uh, um, you know uh, the uh, the Democratic Republican even you know affiliation as they vote where where it does it go. And even in the Indian context. So I think these, when we talk about caste, we need to not only talk about Dalit caste per se, we need to talk about all this, you know, multi varieties that inform. And I think that's when, if these come out, especially American conglomeration of multiple castes, if you look at the ethnicities, if they represent as a caste, has given that, you know, model 
Indian kind of system then maybe fits more abruptly in, into this? Thank you. Um, I think for me it's also instructive to firstly and, and to all three of your answers kind of reminded me uh, to also flag that so much of the literature that comes out of South Asia, especially India, uh, also comes out of some organized cabals, right? And most of these are also, uh, most of these are uh, almost exclusively Brahmin or upper caste, but exclusively controlled also by Brahmins and upper caste. So, uh, and I think a lot of the uh, ways in which upper caste authors, young authors, are able to get patronage, access to networks, uh, publishing houses. I, I, I can probably speak a little bit to that because yeah. I, I used to work at Penguin India. I was an editor, a junior editor. But uh, yeah, so I went out of college, university, first master's degree, and I went to Penguin India. I thought, you know, people mostly do one master's degree. So that's what I thought was going to be my career. I hit a glass wall, like glass ceiling, really, really fast, like within a year or so. Oh. And I mean, within half a year, like they were really, really happy to have me at the office, and probably because I was a token minority, I didn't know that. But um, yeah, I just like kept getting passed up for like pretty much every opportunity. I worked a lot of overtime. Like people said, you're a great worker, extra work, no money. Um, uh, that's so, right, that they do. And I. Which is why I kind of restarted my academic, like I went, went out of that. And so the fun thing, the fact that I write in science fiction fantasy and I did not write in magic realism, and I don't always talk about this in Indian communities because in the southern communities people get super hostile, is that you're so far behind southern literary fiction, it wouldn't even get published. But the thing is, when I get published here, and I'm getting published by non South Asian Americans, a lot of them are white people. You write a good story, they'll see it. But you're, you're putting through the Savarna system, like there will be a lot of other factors. Like even if I like, you know, sell a book from, look, a book publisher always gives you an advance depending on how much that book will sell. Like maybe even they're not being biased. But they will look at the sales value and they will give you the advance or whatever, like even an offer. Now, a name like me does not sell millions in India, especially if it comes out of India. So, I was just like not going to get a book deal, which I do here. Like when I write stories with Dalit and this story, if you read the whole thing, you, you can see very strong Dalit markers. Like there are places where people will just call this character, well, you lord, that's what will you understand, right? And an American editor will buy that. Like if, so, Coming to America, like Yashika was talking about, like it frees us in some ways. Like we, it frees us from that system in which we were not winning. Yeah. Um, thank you for reminding us that uh, published uh, Dalit authors in India is itself a fantasy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll get uh, two or three questions. Uh, okay. First, you and then you. And <laughs> yes, the two of you at the back, please. And then. So I wanted to ask you to uh, please speak about your path and journey in finding agents and publishers and connecting with them. Okay. Um. Okay, yeah. Um, so my question is for all three of you and perhaps to you as well, Jibo, is do you think there exists a space today for all kinds of Dalit writing? Or do you think that um, this Savarna uh, dominated media and literary space is still uh, more uh, attached to narratives of victimhood. Um, do you think they consume that more than, than theorizations, narratives of liberation, revolution, all kinds of writing? Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, so partly the publishing system, I mean, any publishing system, I mean, we're all working within systems, and systems are created by the dominance, right? So, um, I mean, yes, clearly the market chooses certain authors, and the market chooses certain authors when the politics that support those authors become valuable. So, I mean, between translations, I mean, between the vernacular and the English, the reading public becomes different, and the economic and social position of the re readership becomes different. So obviously, it's not, I mean, I, I, I feel like I'm talking about very obvious things. Uh, you can go. Um, <laughs> there are a few questions I've asked. Agents, first of all, um, I think I'm a disruptor here, sitting over here. I was never supposed to write a book. I never wanted to write a book. There was a course in Columbia J School about book writing, and I laughed at everybody who took it. Was that <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, um, there, was, there was no plan. Um, I think the reason I ended up writing a book is because the note that I wrote connected with a lot of people. So and you got a nonfiction offer? I got an did. offer. I did. I, I got offered to, I got two publishing offers. Um, and, and I had my pick. And that's how I was able to get an agent because I had two offers. Um, so my experience is radically different, but I also understand this is a complete anomaly. Because in a way, I was, without knowing, grooming myself for exactly this point. I understood very well how media worked. I understood very well how upper caste systems work because I looked and behaved and lived as an upper caste person. And when I say upper caste, it's all quotes and quotes. I do not believe in the hierarchy of upper versus lower caste. So, yeah, so in the publishing system, that kind of recruitment is actually not very rare. Right. Okay, so, um, say, Suraj's work was your PhD thesis, so you had already written it, and you sent it out to publishers, no? no? Okay, cool. Yes. Um, for a lot of nonfiction memoir-like books, like sometimes publishers would just look for interesting people who have interesting voices and they will send you an offer right. to write it later. Like, unlike, say, for novels, you usually have to send them, like, you have to write your novel on your own and then, like, send it out to agents and, like, wait for them. So, I don't have a novel yet. I have an agent on my, on the strength of my short fiction. So once again, that's not a very common path, but, and I, when I selected my agent because I could take a pick, I, my agent is American because I do sell in America. And I chose an agent, my agent actually represents Nora Jennison as well. And I chose an agent who picked an author who did not have a market at that time, like maybe a decade ago or so, black women's science fiction was not selling. The publishers didn't care. Like they just clearly, openly said, "Who wants to read science fiction by a black woman?" And this is an agent who picked up this person, Nora Jennison, won three Hugo Awards in the last three years. Like she is, if one science fiction writer from our generation is re like remembered, only one, it would be that person, that black woman. And I wanted that agent who can see a writer who's good but doesn't have a market yet, and believe in that writer, and place that writer in the market. And that's what I prioritize. Which, once again, not everybody has a privilege to, because usually your agent chooses you. Like, you send out to all the people and whoever takes you. So, I mean, I can't really give that out as advice. Yeah, but, but I do want to say, look at, right. it's telling how there are two people here, three, all three of us did not come through traditional forms of publishing. If we were, we would not be here. The reason, yeah, I mean, that's what I was saying. I was a journalist, I, understood, I knew how to work the system really well. And I worked it to my advantage. Uh, I wrote the way I knew that would sell. I wrote articles that I knew would prime me for this. And I think that knowledge really helped. And I, I would encourage all of us to go and <laughs> to get that understanding and gain the system. Yeah. Um, those excellent questions. Um, since we are on the agent topic, um, you know, agent has a negative connotation in India. Dalali. 
<laughs> you know? And uh, I was always, you know, had that mental pressure, so I never, you know, uh, got to one. Um, and uh, so this was basically, you know, most of the time the publishers were like, you know, uh, I have this book idea, and they were like, yeah, let's go. And, you know, it, it just worked out because uh, the editors at the publishing house were very, you know, approachable kind of people, and I was like, you know, whatever. So I didn't pay attention to the whole global rights and all and all, and I think. Do you have an agent? Do you not? Uh, no, but, but you know, but like my. You my, we need to get you an agent. My boss was like, he, he put me in touch with an agent. And anyway, so I was talking with Arundhati, Arundhati Roy. She was like, yeah, bro, you gotta get one. <laughs> <laughs> so she's like, I'll, I'll speak to my agent and you know, you, you can. I studied publishing studies. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I could have, like, that was one of the jobs I was looking at. <laughs> so, you know, um, and of course, now, when you talk about, you know, probably an agent, you know, like, uh, there are four uh, publishing houses academic, and uh, uh, they want me to write something, and, you know, they've already said, why don't you write that? And so, there is always this interest. One is really pissed me so hard, just a few days ago, writing a biography of Baitkar. He's like, you gotta write a biography of Baitkar, and this is how we'll plan it, and, you know, <laughs> and, and, it was a very intense conversation, and I enjoyed his interest. It's like, wow, how oh, well, you know, he thinks I'm, I'm right about my hero, <laughs> which is, you know, I've been thinking about that. So the translations, uh, Sharan Kumar Limbare uh, wrote his Akkarmashi, and it was translated as The Outcast by OUP Delhi. And the translator actually, instead of, you know, when you read through the translator's note, he's almost like putting down <laughs> the guy he's translating, you know, because Sharan Kumar, Sharan Kumar Limbare was not really happy about certain translations and they had, of course, you know, there's always back and forth and, and so when I read that guy, I was like, what an asshole, you know, <laughs> he's, he's actually translating this important book and this guy was a Brahmin translator, you know, and then even, you, you go and read that in translator's note, he, he just, he just said, he just calls out, like, Sarin Kumar Limbari as, you know, almost trying to say that inefficient kind of, you know, a uh, person and, you know, um, and, and that, that really gave me, and so my book currently is in seven languages, they are undergoing translation, and I was like, I don't care uh, uh, what caste the person is, they need to respect, you know, uh, the politics of it. I just don't want them to it to be a project that they can add on their say, that's not going to work with me. I want someone who will be, you know, committing, at least for some years, to the cause. Or else there's no point in, you know, me giving chance to somebody or elevating someone this way. That's, that's just like a, you know, and so, in Marathi translation, we have to cancel too. Like, I know, I don't know how to read Marathi, but the other part, Tamil, for example, I took advice of uh, Paranji, hey man, what do you think about this? And when he said, okay, then, you know. So, the reason that being is, the richness in non-English sphere is, you know, Babur or Babul, for example, because I know how to read. You know, one reads that, man, and it's like, the world is circling around, literally. You know, the X-Man, the, the bald guy, when he goes there and the world, that's literally what this, you know, this, this, this writing kind of gives us. And to just answer uh, Christina's question <clears throat> is, I think, you know, I've been thinking about it, that, you know, there has to be a Dalit Writers Guild, which actually, you know, promotes a space. We've been thinking about it, more workshopping, and, you know, more kind of support mentor based kind of things. Because if we have, you know, let's use the networks, right? I mean, I'm happy to, you know, so many Dalit writers now come to me and I'm like, I push for the, the publishers I work with and I can use the moral pressure uh, to, to, to accept that and you know, because there is always this uh, 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 policing of, uh, you know, styles, policing of, you know, uh, the, the, the phrasing of statements and most of the time it's typographical, you know, people like they don't know, I'm like, you gotta do this. And, uh, they always use the same merit argument but in a very lewd way. Almost feels like you know cringeworthy. Like why you even say that? You know this is such a thing they have written. And so the court polishedness and all that. So if there is a space of such sort that kind of creates a new, you know, I mean, you know, science fiction. Come on, man. I mean, I don't know any Dalit writer, at least in English language, who thinks through that space. You know, many of us have been forced into writing autobiographies. To almost like you know uh, have an exhibition of our victimhood, so one feels guilty, almost the Christian guilt one has for a moment, you know, and then what I want to do, and and they have trapped us in that hole so strongly 
that one cannot but go and cry about it. You know, Anand Telgumudi once said, when I read this about autobiography, he's like, this is basically asking to cry more. You know, just asking to lament more. And I think there is more to that. You know, there is more to uh, more to sensorial, you know, uh, spaces. Roja Singh actually wrote a good book which talks about music, how women use music to perform, you know, especially the Dalit women in their villages. And I think these diverse genres, the Brahminical space doesn't know what to do. Because they only know two things. One is celebration and one is pain. Because that's how the the, 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 the grief and, and as well as the celebratory festivities circle around that. There is nothing that kind of alters. For us to think about celebration is to challenge the very status quo of the Brahmin or the Brahminical order. And I think that's something nobody wants to risk because if I write, I'm going to challenge their ancestors. I'm going to call out their criminal caste groups who have put my ancestors and continue to put people like me and my fellow Dalits down. You know, so that idea is, is so so threatening that they will always alter, you know, and this happens when I write columns too. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, like all, all this, you know, slashing. And that's why I think, uh, uh, to answer to your question, Christine, I think we need a, a kind of a guild in a way um, that will, you know, yeah. So I, I have some thoughts about that as well. So um, I also think more than a guild, because a guild, like as soon as you start an organization, there need to be people running it, yeah. right? I also think some of us, those of us who have a little more money, etc., can get, say, a Dalit literature student who are like all over there in India, right, or here, wherever, to say, do a monthly column in a major newspaper or something of Dalit literature, where this person is reading all kinds. So this person, like a literature student, is more or less recent, or a literature graduate, is equipped to read science fiction and non-fiction and whatever, like, you know, you don't really need a lot of background to read Dalit science fiction because uh, there's one person. So, you know, if somebody is reading just Dalit as a vertical, say a monthly column in a newspaper, where one month there's non-fiction, one month there's poetry, one month mm. there's translation, and maybe there's just one author, and even if, say, the newspaper isn't paying them a lot because a lot of Indian newspapers don't, um, if some mm. of us find that person, that we're giving them the books, we're sending them the books, we're maybe, you know, newspaper give, giving them 4,000 or maybe even nothing, we give them $100 each one they write, right? I like that. So, like that brings the work to the attention to a lot of people because we form a guild, only we will know each other. Like writers are public facing individuals, you need to get, it, get the work to the public. Yeah, I also want to answer, answer Christina's question. Um, I totally agree with you, actually. I think the space is not ready for stories that are beyond victimhood. And you did an excellent review for my book in school, and you wrote that too. One of the reasons my book has connected so much because it is, um, it, it forces me to show people my pain. And of course, when you <coughs> bleed to death on the page, people connect with it. But I often wonder if I didn't do that, would it have the same impact? And I'm also thinking about the next book, if I'm not showing my wounds, will that have the same impact? Because, you know, like I said earlier, it was, I've been very strategic about what, how I wanted this book to be and how I wanted to reach an audience. And writing about these stories, which are nevertheless true, was a very informed choice. Because, like I said, media narratives, I understand how they work and their control. But also, I think uh, people like us on this panel, each one of us, and you included, now we can create a platform mm -hmm. and, and push stories forward. And like you said, Suraj, push forward stories of celebration and joy, and stories that are not just our pain, not just glorifying, it's called, what is it called, um, pain for? That's beyond that. So I think, um, thankfully, we should be able to create a platform like this. Uh, also, I mean, a lot of this conversation is also constantly flagging the complete precarity, uh, right, of the lives of uh, many, many writers who come from our communities and do not have the kind of institutional support that a lot of uh, nephews and, and nieces of uh, upper caste authors have. Uh, yes. 
and then maybe we can come here and we will do it. Yeah, and from there. So I um, thank you all very, very much for, for speaking. Um, I've always seen very different ways in which each of you engages with, with, with the word in some sense, right? So there's experimental prose, there is, um, you know, I think as Jessica was saying, a kind of very uh, considered sense of the way that narratives work and, and their you know, impact, and sort of in a sense experimenting between the ethnographic, the autobiographical, the sociological in some sense. So I wanted to actually go back and ask about this question of the relationship between imagination and surrealism. And to go back to something that I think Sukaj said about going back and thinking about, um, I think you said your grandmother's world and, and what she had to offer. And I think I'm, I, I'd be very interested to know what, um, and any of you can take this up or all of you, but what it is that for you is, um, uh, forms a kind of canon or some set of you know, must reads what kind of imaginative or experimental work for you actually allows you to go beyond mm. the demand that that this writing has to be about identification? So especially Mimi, I see is sort of posing this question of disidentification, right? You're actually sort of thinking about worlds that you don't inhabit and that you have to kind of I mean, bring yourself into or imagine kind of other selves and so on. So I'm just really interested in what what uh, what you read or what allows you to think about your own writing in a sense that is it from your So I'm yeah, just taking up from the profession. Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you all for being here and thank you all for being here and holding the space for all of us. Um, so gathering from what you talked earlier, I'm wondering what's your experience in the Indian diaspora here in terms of how you experience the caste system. Mm -hmm. And also, connect, uh, related to that, how do you uh, couch this topic of caste system to an upper class Indian person of the Indian diaspora here in America? I don't. I, I largely don't. I'm <laughs> 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 Indian diaspora. I go to festivals, and uh, the only Indian friends I have are like these activist community people who I like know have a certain kind of values. Like I never go to like I never go to unfiltered Indian spaces. Yeah, uh, the reason I'm asking this question um, is uh, because. Also, too much vegetarian food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the reason I'm asking is because uh, I feel it's important to bring this subject to people because some of my friends and classmate, uh, classmates I grew up with and they are here, they are completely clueless about it and they say, How, Where's the caste system? I was there with you, but I didn't hear any such questions, such Can you comments, hear? such insults. Yeah, uh, let me just take that question and then come back. Listen, 
I am really discriminated against. And like, it never happened to me, but what it really did. I am not entering that conversation. So I was like, I'm just rude. I mean, I mean you're not interesting. I'm, I'm like, am I interested in explaining things to you? No. Exactly. It's not the job like, of other people. Person. Person. No, exactly. We're not, we, we are not here to um, educate upper caste Indians who already have a legacy of caste, who have turned a blind eye to how they only marry within the same caste and never question that. I think they know. Um, I mean, with regard to uh, how to navigate, and you know, I think that, that that's the you know that's why you know uh, I'm using it in a very caution to be in a pioneer, quote unquote, or to be is a person or a, to start off has always had to bear two responsibilities. One is hitherto nothing has happened, and so you have to now carry the whole burden, and you think yourself too much. And second is, <laughs> second is you have to give a direction so the next year or the year after or, or whenever they do this, there is a form. I think because of these two dancing moves, it just kind of uh, outmaneuvers many of the acrobatics one has to do. Uh, me personally, I don't give a damn to them. I don't give a shit, really. Why is the moralistic claim always on the list? Exactly. And many times, you know, especially this Brahmin lefts have enjoyed every privilege their grandfathers, grandmothers have, and gave them through the ownership of land and suddenly came here and became leftists. Mm -hmm. And now want to talk all about moralistic things and, you know, like, fuck off. Get the fuck out of my ass. Otherwise, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't need you know, all this bastardized grammars on me. But what they are usually doing is they're trying to find a lacuna of some sort. Now, the way I think, the way I do is because also I think I come from a social movement, I have a background. Like I can subvert intellectually as well as other ways. And I know how to work it out. It doesn't mean I'm invincible. There are a lot of horrendous barriers, you know, and especially because you see, you, you write something, and I don't see myself personally as a literary sphere. I think what I, I always try to put out myself out of that. Uh, the reason being, I would rather be an organizer and a social movement. Whatever comes out of that, if it becomes a literature, fine. But literature has always become a, a like a wine and dine concept. Basically, in India, it's very Brahminical. You have state literary conferences, you know, and in that, it is mostly this sensorial images that they present through various. And the Dalit sphere had to create their own Dalit literary festivals way back, you know, 1955s and all onwards. We know this 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 element existing. Dalit literary sphere, if you talk about, then I am all for it. Mm -hmm. If you talk about other whatever non dalit literary sphere is, I will have a slight hesitation to even accept because it is built on a very fragile uh, egos of upper caste. And they really want to, you know, uh, navigate their own selves. And so I get invited to all this, you know, events and da da da. And, you know, uh, I am looking for the Dalits in the audience. I'm like, anybody Dalit here? Raise your hand. And I say, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing it. Because you deserve the thank you. Others have always been self-congratulating through TVs. When they read a, a column in the paper, they feel, oh, such a nice. <laughs> but for Dalits, there is no space there. They have to, they have to struggle. Exactly. So my thing is, I love my people. And I will continue to love them. And I will love them also as a form of protest. Because I am told not to love my people. The deformities. You see, every time, for example, when a Dalit assertion comes, they talk about the subcaste among Dalits. Oh, but Dalits are not united. Mm -hmm. I tell Brahmins, even you are not united. Yeah. RSS is a Brahmin house. Yeah. Communist is also a Brahmin house. Close to 550 subcaste among Brahmins. 
they seldom talk about themselves. And for me, it is to make a universalist moralist claim to now say, I don't align with this Dalit politics now. Wherever I go, people are asking me, what do you think of Chandra, uh, Chandra Shekhar Aza? I ask them back, what do you think of Sita <laughs> You know, what do you think of Nirmala Sita They are confounded. Yeah, trans are broke. This is a space of how Brahmins are occupying almost every other space and their failure is becoming a national failure. Yet, Brahmins are not held accountable for that. The entire state, and that's why the whole you know, economy is falling, nobody is holding accountable uh, Nirmala Sitaraman right now. But the, the, but the, but the, you know, the gestations towards something else has been done. Whereas in our spaces, and that's why, be it literature or be it any other form, I call it, it's a Harlan moment for the Nets. It's a unique, it's a, it's, a, it's a unique space. I mean, it, it was not possible. I mean, I was being here for so long. It, it, it would not have been like self-published authors and you know, reputed journalists, you know, coming and you know, claiming that space. So, on the American example, as they have answered, I come. I studied in three different continents before coming to America. So I have a, I have a slightly. It's not like coming straight from India, right? And so for me. The racial aspect is very central. I look at how Indians are racist, irrespective of caste. Because they, they, they support a system that is oppressing black people. Yeah. You know? And on the black victimhood, South Asians tag along. I never understand. When they came from India, they have a story of poor parents coming. Why are you even saying this? Were your parents enslaved here? Were your parents incarcerated here? Did you have to face that immediate oppression? I understand your individualized familial story has a story. But when it comes to celebration, you will sport your genu as a medal of honor. So you can operate in these two spaces. And I think these dilemmas that we operate into, where now I have to do three works. One is deracialize the South Asian makeup. Second, insert caste consciousness into this whole some nature. And third, tell them we are not Republicans. <laughs> Be the last set of questions that we'll take. Uh, you and then you. Okay. Hi, my name is Renu Sheher. So, um, as some people in the audience know, and I'm sure like, the speakers know, that um, Ambedkar, in, like, in the mid 50s, converted to Buddhism to protest um, you know, the caste of our side that unfortunately is a part of Hinduism and um, kind of led like a neo Buddhist movement because at that point, like Buddhism had largely.
So uh, the question that you asked first, um, I read, and I, I'm still actually pretty new to my English history in America for years, and I actually spend most of it reading my English history, which is something that I'm expanding from. So I'm reading poetry, I'm trying to read some Native American work, which, I mean, a lot of that has, like I, I largely read different kinds of people of color, science fiction and fantasy for a very long time. I read, um, if you're asking strictly outside South Asia, so like refugee science fiction fantasy, like from different refugee communities from other countries, people who were persecuted by their countries. And these are ways in which I didn't study history in India. So like say, the fact that a lot of Sikhs in this country are um, kind of refugees from 1984, right? Like refugee is a term that India does not get to use because India, like these atrocities, these pogroms that happen in India are globally don't get recognized mm -hmm. because India always has the clout to not get globally recognized, which means, well, I am technically a refugee. I don't want to go back, but I came in with a student visa. I had to, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So these kinds of refugee narratives, central, um, South and Central American refugee narratives. So, but I largely read a lot of it through the lens of science fiction and fantasy, and I'm finally, finally beginning to read Native American work, which means, um, okay. And uh, you asked about Bengali work, right? I, wow. I'm recently reading, reading Manoranjan Bapari, but I didn't read a lot of Bengali Garik work. Now, I was, a couple of years ago, I would have just said there isn't much, but I have learned that sometimes when I say uh, there isn't much, it means I haven't seen much. Because I used to read more in Bengali when I was younger, but my parents kept me tremendously shielded from the Dalit community because like, since I did not really write an autobiographical book and I haven't talked about my autobiography, but that's also one vertical where my parents did not, like my parents really submerged me in Savarna culture so that I didn't get to really like, I didn't know any other Dalit growing up. So I didn't know, and I'm still trying to find out what Bengali Dalit literature exists, really, yeah. Yeah, so this book is a result of being inspired by the African-American struggle, as far as I'm concerned. The reason I came out and the reason I can identify what passing even meant was because I, I knew that this was uh, literature and cinema that was a part of African American universe. And, um, you know, Anupama, you asked a question earlier about inspiration, and it's, this is directly related to your question. I was in class with Marianne Hirsch, for those of us who go to Columbia might know her. And we talked about passing and in, in, in that module, we also looked at a lot of movies in the 1950s. Uh, movies on passing were really big in Hollywood. Everybody, a lot of white directors wanted to sensationalize how, who are these people who live in these two worlds? And uh, how they're able to go in and out of them. And there's a really popular movie by Douglas Sirk, 1959, it's called The Imitation of Life. And it's about, it's the story of this woman who can easily pass off as white, and her mother, who's African-American, um, is also working in the house, and she rejects her completely. And she rejects her entire life. She comes and meets her, and it's really traumatic and tragic. She comes and meets her, asks her how she's doing, wants an, an emotional connection with her. And this young woman doesn't want anything to do with her until she dies. And, um, at her funeral, in this version, this movie has been made three or four times, but in this version, there is this beautiful, and I say beautiful because it was really beautiful for me to watch that, and intense funeral scene where this woman is now finally having a moment of reckoning about what she's done. She has not only lost her mother, but she's also lost her identity. And when I watched that, and I'm so grateful to Professor Hirsch for making me watch that film because I think that was the moment in my head when I came out. When I watched her mourn the loss of the life that she could have had, I immediately thought about the life that I could lose if I didn't do this. 
And since then, since that class, every time I kept thinking of ways to come out and not have to, maybe not out myself completely, maybe not reveal myself, maybe write an article somewhere, but really as an upper class person, it was not possible. Mm -hmm. What that movie did for me and the narratives that I read changed me. And it was just not possible for me to hide myself anymore. And beyond that, I think the movements that I finally, I, I strongly feel aligned with are the Latinx movement. Mm -hmm. I find their struggles of, um, you know, the challenges that they face, the undocumented community here. Um, mm -hmm. I, I find a lot of solidarity there. I'm involved in a few spaces in Brooklyn and there is so much space and solidarity there for us to share our struggles. And that's that's deeply healing for a bunch of us, to be in those non-white spaces, to be in those radical spaces, and just to be heard unconditionally, without being challenged, without being questioned, without us having to prove ourselves. Because, you know, struggle sees struggle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think not just me, I, you know, a lot of us here, and all, all Dalits, really identify with these um, struggles against white supremacy, struggle, struggles against patriarchy, but only if they're intersectional, you know. Um, and it becomes a life source. I don't have a connection to the Indian community here. The only connection that I have are my friends and other activists who understand where I'm coming from without me having to explain that, which is why, for me, it's deeply important to be connected to these movements and feel validated in some way. Thank you for those three questions. Um, on the, you know, on the Buddhism part, thank you very much for bringing that up. I think um, uh, Buddhist identity is very militant. If you look to Ambedkar Buddhism, it's very radical, it's very political. It's actually one of the pain in the Hindutva RSS project. Because the Ambedkar Buddhists, uh, they are you know very feisty. And you know, they almost wherever they go, they run a movement, like in America too. We have the uh, you know people who grew up in that because the Buddhist ethic that is given to them, uh, which is very Navayana uh, type, which kind of removes them from the totality of the meditative spiritual aspects only that give them a space to you know anchor you know and, and that, that's why I think many new Dalits for example who didn't grow up in Buddhist identity now they look at like well Ambedkar did that there has to be some purpose and I think there is a lot that is now taking place in, 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 in that and more and more organizations like Bamsef who is operating deep into villages and all they approach it you know basically you know Dalits have multiple religions you know, and, and each saint, uh, you know, who came in various parts of the regions, uh, the 17th, 18th century, they gave new identities to them. And, and now it's, it's a thing of the separate Dalitness. We had Adi Hindu, Adi Ravida, Adi movements. And then also we had, you know, Guru Ghasidas, for example, in the Chhattisgarh region. And, you know, uh, if you go in the Tamil, more, most probably, you know, Ayutitas, so it's Buddhism, you know, and then there are Christians. So I think the independent identities exist, but now the thing is, how do we bring them out as, as, as a subject that can challenge? Dalit Buddhists have managed to do that, because of course it was a call of a that curve that could work out. So on the solidarity aspect, and I think I know it is something I've been thinking about it, is to, for example, when the Dalit Panthers wrote, um, you know, Raja Dali, for example, and again, this is how, if you occupy the space, I'm planning to get Raja Dali's writings into English and publish it because of a very, very, very crucial, important voice coming out of that. He was translating African American poets, you know, in, in the late 1960s uh, into Marathi. And, 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 you know, he was the kind of guy who, who, who thought of that region. And unfortunately, of course, organization died and, you know, uh, but it has not died completely. <laughs> it is alive in many of us. Uh, the Panthers are still, you know, um, but what couldn't happen is the Black Panthers knew almost nothing about the Dalit Panthers. Right? I went and talked to Bobby Seal and his team, and they were like, "Wait, what?" <laughs> and 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 then you know, of course, uh, 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 Catherine Cleaver knows. I think she's at Emory, 
and we are trying to do. But now the idea is, these Panthers are alive. What if we get them together under one space? Be it India or be it America. And let them at least meet once for their life. Jabi Pawar is there, you know, and many other Panthers are alive. And here also, I think if we are if we, if we are able to do that, maybe it's us to discuss, I mean, but I think this is my really a dream of being in American space kind of things, you know, to work. To answer Ratik's question, I think, see, I grew up in Ambedkar weather. <laughs> you can't go any more than that. There's no, you know, and it's, uh, my dad was a Dalit Panther. Of course, later he joined up, he went to Kanchi Ram's movement, bounce it, and then, you know, we see BSP kind of. So, uh, most likely in the kind of background I come from, we are given two books to read. Uh, and they are an um, annihilation of caste. Jati Vyavastita Vidhvans, that's how it is called in Marathi. And Buddha is Dhamma. Uh, and, and I read that book, uh, Buddha is Dhamma and this in Marathi. So whenever you go for little competitions, you win something in your belly, there are two books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, most likely, you, most likely you, you read this. And annihilation of caste is a very difficult text to understand if you come from uh, a non-background at all, because Ambedkar is not hell out of references. Which, thankfully, yes, Anand has done a good job to annotate that and then give us where he Ambedkar is drawing and you know bringing that uh, forward. But the, the translations are done by Dalits themselves. You know, you know, you see different translations and they are so beautiful. But some of the people, for example, and again, that's what Dalit literary sphere. When I make distinction, these are not like trained scholars. These are basically one who is working for a best bus company, who is a who is a driver, who is a conductor. Who is a bank employee? Dalit Panthers were with Jabi Poor bank employee and uh, Rajan Hale was working for some other government service. They did that and still did the other work of producing literature. So that's why the literature cannot be seen in the sense of uh, very Shakespearean, you know, uh, where sitting and you know inventing new words. So these are the, 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 the new formulations. Now, within the translation framework, I am very committed. To the non English sphere. Because I think that has given so much validity. The Dalit movement is alive because although Ambedkar wrote much of his writing in English, his speeches and all were in Marathi. The speeches he gave, which is basically again a huge repository and richness that, that, that comes about it. So within this translation framework, within the language framework, what we see is a, a, a kind of inconsistency to use our language. And why is that inconsistency? It's because each time period is looking at annihilation of caste differently. You know, that's why annihilation of caste, if you read immediately when Bhazar Ambedkar, of course, in 1936, and he gave and it came to me. I remember reading first time and I was like, I thought my dad is punishing me. <laughs> and he, this is so difficult to read in Marathi, especially written in a very jargonist fashion. And until at least you understand that type of Marathi, <laughs> you were your 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 Buddha is Dhamma, for example, and Fule. Also, I should mention, Fule's writings are also you know rich Marathi language. Unless you are part of that in a way subaltern culture, it's difficult to understand because Fule is like calling out Brahmins in a way where we are like, you should not be so crude and so rude, so rude. But then you know we we get the sense of it, and I think that's why. The layerings that we have, that we have produced ourselves, and that's why I'm very, when I say my fears, my fears are this, that the origins have to be hold on to. They cannot be filtered through social media things and other, no, 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 there is, there is a lot that's happening there. And that's why I'm saying, uh, many people, the, 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 the Twitter theoreticians, you know, we have to be, we have to be, we have to be careful because there is much more to that. With what happens. And just to conclude on Mayawati, for example, uh, you know, there is a lot of negativity around Mayawati and, you know, and especially I tell you here in these spaces, Brahmin women have bitterly, bitterly criticized. And these are the Brahmin women who claim themselves as feminists, who claim themselves as the global solidarities. And when I dropped Mayawati, the M word, you can see how this, how this comes back. And this is because Marathi doesn't support and quote converse in English. Marathi doesn't have the rapport. But I'm saying, did Jayalalitha have any rapport? Did, did Mamata Banerjee had any rapport of that what you're trying to, you know? But this caste kind of framework fits into adjusting this complicated narratives of people like Marathi and other, you know, courageous women from this background. Yeah, I just want to add to one 
second. Uh, just on Mayavati, I think it goes back to our question on visibility and how Mayavati presents herself. Mm -hmm. She looks like an obvious Dalit woman that can be called out. And I think how people, and, and Indian feminists in particular, when they react to Mayavati in such a strong and uh, way that's filled with bitter hatred, they're also reacting to the visible markers of her caste, the way she does her hair, the, kind, uh, the way she dresses, the way she presents herself. I think those are all factors that matter. And when, coming back, which is why it's so important that as Dalits we present ourselves and just radically assert who we are without being apologetic about it. <laughs> um, thank you to our panelists for this wonderful conversation. I think uh, also to Ratik, I think one of the things that really come out when one talks about uh, Bengali literature, because Bengalis won't stop talking about themselves, is that... Um, you say themselves and not us. <laughs> um, is, is also that, uh, is, is also kind of flags the importance of autonomous Dalit political movements, which are so alive in many parts of the country, but which Bhattu looks have systematically ensured have not bloomed uh, in West Bengal. Uh, thank you to our panelists for having uh, done all this uh, uh, conversation, really educating us on a lot of ways in which uh, young Dalit writers are holding on to both the power and the precarity uh, of uh, their writing. Uh, I think in, in uh, just goes to show that uh, new Dalit writing doesn't mean one thing um, and kind of means all of the things that they brought to the table. Thank you so much. Let's let's also you know acknowledge this very well person very sitting next to me because I think I think you know Dubo has been very humble, <laughs> you know. But I think being in the space they are yeah. and doing the things they are doing, I think really deserves a commendation on and then let's give it up to you. <laughs> Thank you everyone, thank you panel, thank you Dravo. Uh, we will take the lunch, there's like Indian lunch right outside, uh, restrooms on your right side. Please uh, wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> and don't serve yourself, uh, there are volunteers helping you. So please, uh, we'll join in like 1.30, 1.45ish. So we have two more fantastic panels. We have Equality Labs, Tim Money, uh, joining us for the next one, speaking about Dalit and the digitality. And then we have another intersectional panel uh, right after that. So Christina is on it. Please, <laughs> Come join us. Uh, have your lunch and come join us. Thank you, Thank you so much.